Hey there, uh, Dr. Vadis. Thank you very much for uh, that very informative talk. So uh, just going from the top here, um, uh, first question is, could uh, MCAS be triggered after a CSF leak being sealed? And could it also be responsible for a prolonged rebound uh, high pressure, even if MCAS was never present before the EBP? It's a very interesting question, and thanks for that. So um, we see basically two types of presentations of mast cell activation syndrome. One type is sudden onset, and it's literally people describe that it's from one day to the next. They become highly symptomatic, whereas they were high functioning and perfectly well before that. And then there's a more insidious type that starts from a very young age and people will say, well, I've had it for as long as I can remember. So I guess within your question is, you know, when I think about that, if we have somebody who's got a CSF leak and they've got EDS and we know that there's a very close correlation, I'm not sure that it's causal, but let's call it a correlation anyway between EDS and mast cell activation syndrome, then perhaps it's the background of EDS that was responsible for, um, no, I shouldn't say responsible, but it was the background of EDS that made it more likely that an individual might have mast cell activation syndrome as opposed to the CSF leak itself. Okay, thank you, Dr. Vadis. So moving on to uh, the next question. So we have an audience member uh, saying that she's been uh, allergic since she was a child, but not allergic to food until up, a year, up until a year ago. She's now allergic to everything, including nuts, uh, fruits, uh, all kinds of pollen uh, and uh, asthma triggers. Uh, the question for you is, do you think these changes in her allergies could have a relation to MCAS and, and her leak problem? Would it make sense to get tested? She is hypermobile with a Baton score of eight out of nine um, and is currently awaiting testing for EDS. She does have a diagnosis of IBS, Hashimoto's thyroiditis is positive ANA and has had a tryptase test a year ago, which was normal with a result of 2.2. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, you know, people who have mast cell activation syndrome ha are symptomatic, not because they have allergies, but for an altogether different reason that I didn't touch on in my talk. And the reason that, and I'm speculating, I wanna make that clear because it's not in literature, but first of all, the fact that there is this really strong background of autoimmunity um, within the POTS population, within people with EDS, and we know as well that autoimmunity is much more common in women than it is in men. And thirdly, in somebody who has one autoimmune condition, they're much more prone to developing other autoimmune conditions. So having said that, my own bias, and this is the bias I bring as an immunologist, my own bias is that uh, mast cell activation syndrome is also caused by autoimmunity. And I think specifically it's caused by autoantibodies that are directed against the KIT receptor that are activating antibodies. And those antibodies, when they bind to the receptor, will cause mast cells to fire off and release their chemical mediators. There is another receptor on the mast cell called the MRG PRX2 receptor, and it is possible that antibodies can be directed against that receptor as well. So all of this is to say that when somebody has symptoms of mast cell activation syndrome, then it's more likely to be endogenous or autoimmune as opposed to something from the outside world. So when you say that you've got a lot of symptoms, sorry, a lot of allergies, whether it's to tree nuts or pollens or what have you, then those are descriptions of people who have secondary causes of mast cell activation syndrome instead of the so-called idiopathic cause. Now, the two can coexist together, but I don't think that having mast cell activation syndrome will predispose to acquiring more allergies than might have existed beforehand. And, and I think the literature is more or less consistent with that as well. Great, uh, thank you for that uh, thorough answer. So I think we just have one last uh, question here. Uh, what nutritional changes or supplements uh, would be of potential benefit uh, to someone with a CSF leak and possibly EDS? 
And then are there any resources or studies on the connection between nutrition uh, and CSF leaks uh, and or EDS? Uh, I, I, I really can't speak to CSF leaks. I have no expertise there whatsoever. Um, as far as mast cell activation syndrome, there's a lot in, online about um, low histamine diets. They haven't really been validated, but they're not, there's no harm in trying low histamine diets to control those. And that's that's been predicated, again, on some unvalidated data that suggests that there is a deficiency of diamine oxidase in people who have mast cell activation syndromes. There, there really isn't good convincing evidence for that, but if somebody wants to try a low histamine diet, there's no downside to it. There's no toxicity and, and it doesn't lead to any nutritional deficiency. So I certainly have no concerns about it. Okay, uh, great. Thank you very much for that, uh, Dr. Vadis. And uh, yeah, thank you for your time. Uh, it looks like uh, there aren't any, uh, no more questions. And uh, I think uh, we're right at time to move on to the next presentation. Hey, thank you all very much.